Okay, welcome back everyone. We are excited now to move into the next phase of our session to discuss some key issues related to implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. As we've done so far, we're following the flowchart, and so we will be discussing these issues under the third phase called apply. Now, as you can see on this slide, what we're calling the apply phase includes a number of key aspects related to program implementation and monitoring, evaluation, and adapting for scale. Now, once you've designed and tested different prototypes, as the previous se sessions have highlighted, this phase highlights the implementation of those important solutions, whatever those solutions are. Then we use real-time monitoring and evaluation to examine what is working, what is not working, and make adjustments as needed for scale up. We'll focus on a few key issues related to implementation, monitoring, and evaluation today, but there are a number of important resources we are making available to you that will be useful for other topics as well. Now, a critical piece of effective implementation is a program's implementation strategy. Building off of what we have learned and defined and test and def in define and design and test, this strategy should include details about the who, the what, the when, the where, and the how. We want to be thinking about how can the audience that we've chosen to focus on be reached? Who are the particular influencers of that audience? What are the intervention approaches we want to use? What are the activities? What are the channels? And how often should we use those channels? We've highlighted a number of different communication channels here, ranging from electronic media to social media to community media and even interpersonal communication. Programs must be strategic about what intervention mix they will use, the justification, why they've chosen to use that intervention mix, and what their particular audiences of interest are. Now this slide shows an important template that can be really helpful in organizing your implementation strategy. This template can help you think through the different channels you want to use, the preferences, the cost, the reach, and even the specific details related to timing and frequency. For example, say we are interested in working with providers to address provider biases related to sexual and reproductive health. As a result, we decide that we want to use interpersonal communication, digital media, perhaps even some community media. This template helps you think through the details of those choices. Which do you prefer? What are their costs? What is the reach of each of these different approaches? When and how often will you use that channel? And costing and budgeting, as you saw on the previous slide, is a key component of a good implementation strategy and effective implementation. This is important for individual programs, but it's also important for larger social and behavior change initiatives to reach country level commitments. And so Breakthrough Action has worked to develop a really useful checklist that can be helpful for governments, donors, and even individual partners to make sure that SBC is sufficiently integrated into and costed and budgeted for in family planning costed implementation plans. This resource is part of the final set of resources that we'll share as part of these sessions and is one that should be really um, useful for you um, in your work. So once an implementation strategy has been thoroughly developed and solutions are in the process of being implemented, the important question remains, how do you know how your program is doing? In fact, if effective implementation requires frequent data collection from a variety of different sources to troubleshoot hiccups or unplanned challenges. That means not only monitoring in real time how things are going, but also committing to evaluating different approaches to help us understand how and why something is working or not working and to what effect. Monitoring and evaluation help us to make critical decisions that influence subsequent implementation and ultimately scale up. So 
So why are monitoring and evaluation important? Monitoring and evaluation are key to helping us understand the how and the why of some, whether something works or doesn't and to what effect. So in this way, when we're talking about monitoring, we're referring to continuous learning. Monitoring is not only about indicators, which we'll talk about in a few slides, but really about keeping track of events as they take place in a pro project. By doing this, monitoring outputs, estimating coverage, you're able to see whether the programs are being implemented as planned, if they are achieving what they're intended to, and what necessary adjustments are needed along the way to maximize impact. Now this continuous learning process allows for better adaptive management. This means integrating not only the collection of data, but the review and analysis of those findings in real time on a regular basis, on a routine basis, to gather insights about our programs and to make critical decisions as new information comes in. So before we go into more depth to think about monitoring and evaluation, we have an important question for you, and this is one that we want you to reflect on for a little bit. What could be important to monitor during the implementation of a family planning program? What do you need to know during a program to be able to say how, how it's going? Well, in some of the family planning programs that we've monitored, some of the things you might want to think about are things that your program is working to create. For example, how many different um, episodes, how many different materials are being developed. But then you also want to think about whether how that implementation is going, who is being reached by those materials, and then ultimately is that making any sort of a difference? Are people changing their thoughts or their attitudes about contraception or about sexual and reproductive health topics? Are people talking about those topics with one another? And are we seeing any sort of shift in behaviors? Those are some of the things that I might think about monitoring in a program related to family planning. What are some of the things that you think could be important to monitor? Hopefully you took a second or two to think through some of the things that you might think are important to monitor. And hopefully you also notice that some of the examples that I gave include both process and output types of indicators, as well as more intermediate types of indicators, thinking through not just what the program is doing, but ultimately what are, what are the effects of what that program is doing. So one useful way of thinking about monitoring is breaking it into two pieces. First, process monitoring, which you see on the left of this slide, and second, outcome monitoring, which you see on the right. First, process monitoring. With process monitoring, we're talking about counting, tracking, or collecting data on that implementation process itself. How well is the implementation going? How many people have been reached? Are there variations by different types of people or by different uh, locations? What is the cost of that implementation? Second, in terms of outcome monitoring, this refers to the monitoring of the changes you might see in the outcomes you're expecting as part of your project. Do you see the changes that you're expecting? Why? Why not? What could be improved? And so once you start to think about monitoring in this way, you realize that there are many different data sources that you can use for monitoring. For process monitoring, for example, when you're thinking about the implementation process itself, data sources often include things like programmatic records, logs from radio or television stations, maybe even websites or social networking sites, content communities, satisfaction surveys, maybe even qualitative data that could include focus groups or in-depth interviews. Now on the other side, when you're thinking more about outcome monitoring, starting to think about the outcomes of your program and what you're trying to see change and whether that change has happened, data sources can include things like um, a review of data that already exists. That could be uh, routine health information system data. It could be even education information system data. It could also include 
um, nationally representative surveys, census or other vital statistic registries. It could also include other population-based data collection approaches or community surveillance or even rapid assessments. Qualitative research can be really useful at a smaller scale that can be quite look useful at looking at local level changes. And complexity aware methods that are participatory and qualitative, such as most significant change, can be really useful as a monitoring tool. So we've been starting to think about monitoring in new ways, process and outcome, and we've been brainstorming the many different data sources that exist that might have information relevant to us. These data sources help us get information, and they help us get information on specific indicators. So the question remains, what is an indicator? Simply put, indicators are tools that help us measure how an SBC program is doing at whatever stage you're thinking of. They give you specific information that is measurable that help us to understand specifically if program objectives are being met or not, and they often have specific definitions. Now program indicators, to be useful, should be guided by your program objectives as well as your implementation strategy. These indicators are essential to helping your monitoring and evaluation team organize their activities. We often break down indicators into process, intermediate, outcome, and impact indicators, which we'll talk about in a few slides. Now, as I mentioned, program indicators are best when they are guided by your program objectives and are used to help orient your monitoring and evaluation activities. The best program indicators are SMART. Now, SMART is a really useful acronym for those of you who are less familiar that can help you develop indicators that are really useful for your program. The best indicators are specific, meaning that they are related to a certain behavior, attitude, or other um, particular health area of interest. They are measurable, which means that it is something that you can actually collect data for. Um, they are attainable, which means they are possible. They are relevant, that is, they're relevant to your program's objectives and activities, as we've mentioned, and they're time-based. For example, number of health providers trained on family planning counseling, that is most useful when we provide a time-based element. For example, the number of people trained during the last six months. So when we think about indicators, when we think about monitoring, we often think about indicators. But why are they useful for us? As you see on the left of this slide here, indicators help us measure two really important things. First, the effort our program puts in on the top, and at the bottom, um, the actual effect of our efforts. So in terms of effort, how much we've done, how well did we do it? And in terms of effort, is anyone better off? In what ways? What changes have we actually seen? Now to put it in, in other words, to use the language of indicators, process indicators are those indicators that help us to measure the effort our program is putting in, in terms of how much we've done. Now those more intermediate indicators are those that are helping us to think about how well we've been doing those things. Are we starting to see change in the places that we would expect to see change if we were doing things with quality? Those are the intermediate changes that are helping us push us towards the effects we're looking for. Now finally, outcome and impact indicators are those indicators that help us to measure the effects of our efforts, how people are better off as a result of the work that we're doing. And so we can start to think about specific SBC indicators related to family planning at each of these stages, from process, to intermediate, to outcome, to ultimately impact. Now this slide, although the font is quite, a, quite small, uh, highlights some useful indicators that can help give you a sense of what an SBC program working in family planning might consider monitoring. In the process column, those indicators that help track implementation um, are included. And we can think of these as indicators such as the number of outreach activities connected with youth. Uh, conducted with youth, excuse me, or the number of decision makers reached with advocacy activities, 
or even the percent of the target audience that recalls seeing a specific message about family planning on social media. Now, USAID standard indicators are really important to consider here as well. And for example, one indicator that many missions, um, in fact, all missions should report on a yearly basis is the number of individuals in the target population exposed to US government funded family planning messages through radio, television, electronic platforms, community group dialogues, interpersonal communication, or in print. This is a really useful indicator that helps to assess reach of program messages across channels. Now that would be a great example of an indicator that one would include um, here for a family planning program. Now as we move towards more intermediate indicators, we're thinking about tracking how programs are starting to be effective. Here we're considering those intermediate factors that lead to changes in behavior. Those could be things like knowledge or perhaps confidence or even self-efficacy. For example, the percent of your audience that is um, confident that they can use a contraceptive method or the percent of women who can mention at least two modern contraceptive methods. Many of the factors included in this intermediate um, uh, section can be described as in ideational factors, which we'll discuss in a bit more depth in the following slide. Now, outcome indicators help us to see how our program is doing related to our specific outcomes of interest. These are things like key behaviors such as current modern contraceptive use. And then finally, impact indicators help us to track how successful our programs are at achieving those larger programmatic goals related to family planning. Now, this could be things like reductions in maternal and infant death, maternal morbidity, preterm birth, as well as others. Now, what we'd like to do is to share an excellent video from the Nigerian Urban Health Initiative. This video highlights how SBC programs use research monitoring and evaluation to assess the success of their programmatic activities. And what's great about this video is that they highlight how ideational factors were integrated into the key indicators that the program monitored for success over the life of the project. So take a look. Decisions people make and act on depend intimately on the ideas and feelings they have. Therefore, to influence a person's decisions, we first must address their underlying beliefs, emotions, and perceptions. So when the Nigerian Urban Reproductive Health Initiative set out to improve women's health by increasing the use of contraceptives, we started by exploring people's ideas and feelings about family planning. Our initial results helped us identify a set of specific ideas and feelings that predicted whether a woman would or would not use contraception. The more of these predictors that a woman had, the more likely she was to use family planning. This concept is known as ideation. And what were some of these specific predictors? When a woman knew about family planning, when she had a positive attitude towards it, when she had fewer mistaken beliefs about it, when she talked to her husband about it, when she believed that her friends wouldn't criticize her for using it, and when she approved of religious and political leaders speaking about it, then she was far more likely to use it herself. We utilize these predictors to build messages for our strategic communication program. Using ideation in our efforts has been successful. In fact, the results have been measurable. Over 300,000 women who were previously at risk for an unintended pregnancy are now using family planning. Between the baseline and midline research surveys, levels of modern contraceptive use increased in all four program cities. This has allowed Nigerian women to have more control over their reproductive lives, which is good for their families and communities as well. Great. Now, SBC indicators can be quite tricky, and there are a number of important resources available that can support you in efforts to identify the important indicators for your program. 
Our sister project, Breakthrough Research, has helped to synthesize a set of priority recommended SBC indicators specific for family planning. These include indicators from process to intermediate to outcome indicators. They've also collected indicators used in a number of different family planning programs in West Africa, both in French and in English. These resources can be tremendously helpful when developing a program and working to monitor it. Uh, we will include these resources as part of, of um, this session as well. Now importantly, as we've seen over the last few slides, indicators play a really important role in helping us to monitor what we're doing and the effects our programs are having. The development and selection of indicators, however, is critical. We must make sure that we consider a number of different factors when identifying what indicators uh, will be used and what indicators will be important to prioritize over the life of a project. Often we end up with too many indicators, so synthesizing a priority set of indicators is key. First, we have to think about what our program's goals and objectives are. What are we working towards? Then we want to think about our program's theory of change. If you're implementing using the socio-ecological model, for example, and have activities at multiple levels, what indicators will you use to monitor those activities at each of those levels? If you consider the image on the right, for example, indicators can help you to monitor in real time factors at the individual, family, and peer network, community, and even societal levels. Furthermore, you should consider your program's audiences and implementation strategy when identifying the relevant indicators and even the disaggregates for those indicators for your program. As we've outlined, indicators should not only focus on process, but start to think about intermediate outcome and impact as well. By doing this, we can ensure that our indicators are building on the guiding principles of SBC, informed by theory, evidence-based, practical and rigorous. Now, as we progress with the implementation of our programs, we must think not only about monitoring, but also about evaluation. Evaluations help us to answer all of the questions on this slide, and perhaps even more. Questions like, how well did we do, and why? What was successful? What happened? Did we reach our goals? Are the changes that we're seeing in the communities where we're working as a result of our program or as a result of something else that happened at the same time? What can we improve for next time? Evaluation is an essential aspect of any SBC program as it helps us to answer these questions. And what evaluation is, is really the systematic gathering of information to provide feedback on a program and to estimate its impact. Evaluation helps us to see if our project's objectives are being met, why, and what can be learned from the future, or for the future. Now, there are a number of different evaluation approaches, and we could spend all day working through the nuances of each. What we are hoping to communicate here is that there are a number of different evaluation approaches, and that they depend, just like monitoring and indicators, on the goals of the program. Your evaluations can vary by scale, and generalizability from small scale, less generalizable assessments like audience receptions or focus groups to more large scale evaluations using population based surveys. They can also vary by method from quantitative to qualitative and by objective from impact evaluations to looking at cost effectiveness to perhaps using complexity aware methods like most significant change or outcome harvesting both of which can be quite useful in evaluating SBC and family planning programs that are focused on capacity strengthening. There is no one-size-fits-all evaluation design. And so what we're hoping that you can do is to revisit some of the questions that you've been working through as part of the previous sessions and to build on it now some thinking about monitoring and evaluation. Based on what we have talked through today, what might a program focusing on adolescent sexual and reproductive health decide to monitor during implementation? How might you measure success? 
And so um, we would encourage you to ask these questions and think through indicators along this line from process to intermediate to outcome to impact. I have provided a few examples on the following slide just to give um, some, some think, you some thinking about what that might look like, but I encourage you to think in more depth about the type of projects um, that you're proposing and what will be most useful for monitoring success. Before we wrap up, I did want to share some of the examples that I've pulled together for this exercise just to help give you a little bit of a Kickstarter inspiration for some of your own thinking. So if you were thinking about an adolescent sexual and reproductive health program and thinking about monitoring activities on, from process to intermediate outcome and impact, um, some of the things that I might start to think about would be whether adolescents were involved in the design of materials and activities and in the implementation of the program. This sort of builds back to some of what we discussed in previous sessions about participatory and really community engaged work such as human centered design. You might also want to think about indicators like the number of unmarried adolescents who participated in community SBC activities and thinking about what you might disaggregate those data by. So if we want to take more of a gender, um, gender sensitive approach, making sure that we're disaggregating by sex so that we can understand differences between adolescent girls and boys and even people of other genders. Now, if we look more at intermediate indicators, this could be something like the percent of adolescents who are confident that they could get their partners to use contraceptives if they desired. Again, disaggregating by sex. In addition, you could think about a uh, couple communication, but among adolescents. So the percent of unmarried adolescents who spoke with their partner about using a contraceptive method. And then thinking about that time frame again. So it's speaking in the last six months, again, disaggregating by sex. If we move more towards outcome, you could consider looking at contraceptive use among unmarried adolescent girls. Or if you're looking um, uh, specifically at a program focusing on condom use. You might have the percent of sexually active adolescents who use a condom at first sex or maybe at last sex as a way of looking at, at, at contraceptive behaviors. And then finally, thinking about some of the impact um, indicators that might be relevant. Again, this should link back to the goals and objectives of your program, but some that could be considered might be the, the percent of women age 15 to 19 who are mothers or pregnant with their first child, so who have started childbearing in some way. Or you could think about adolescent birth rate as another sort of impact indicator that might be uh, relevant to your overall program. These are just some ideas. Excited to, to see and hear um, some of what you all pull together as well.